from the top 2% of the high school graduates of the, in this country, and our faculty have the largest number of scientific awards and honors, produce the largest number of scientific publications per faculty, which receive the largest number of citations. Our graduate programs are rapidly expanding and are fully international. About half of the nearly 120 PhD students admitted to our programs this year were from outside Turkey. Our faculty receives the second largest number of scientific projects in the country from the Scientific and Technological Research Council of Turkey and have the largest number of projects from the European Research Council. At the undergraduate level, we have more than 400 exchange students from all around the world on our campus this year representing more than 10% of our total undergraduates. Energy is and has always been an irre irreplaceable part of almost every aspect of modern life and is at the heart of human development and economic growth. With increasing energy, demand of rising populations and industrial markets, the topic of energy is a crucial item on the agenda of almost every country. Acknowledging the significance of energy security, most countries today strive to decrease their dependence on imported resources in order to manage their vulnerability to outside challenges and factors beyond their control. Turkey imports 70% of its energy today, and this energy bill constitutes a large fraction of the trade deficit of this country. New technologies must thus be developed in order to most effectively utilize the energy resources of the country. Additionally, it is essential to produce fuels using environmentally friendly technologies, both for sustainable development and for preserving the environment for future generations. The Koch University Tuprash Energy Center was founded as an acknowledgement of the responsibility of universities to contribute to the achievement of these goals. Specifically, we strategically decided to have uh, QTEM, our center, concentrate primarily on three main topics, fossil fuels, biofuels, and solar fuels. With its faculty from engineering, science, administrative sciences and economics, and social science and humanities, the center's objective is developing energy technologies to more efficiently and cleanly utilize fossil fuels and to produce fuels from renewable sources. Our goal is to conduct international research projects integrated with the entire world while educating new generations with strong emphasis on sustainable development. Before turning the floor over to our honorable guest, Dr. Ernst Moniz, I would like to give you a brief summary of his background. As the 13th United States Secretary of Energy, Dr. Ernst Moniz is, uh, is tasked with implementing critical Department of Energy missions in support of President Obama's goals of growing the economy, enhancing security, and protecting the environment. Prior to his appointment, Dr. Moniz was the Cecil and Ida Green Professor of Physics and Engineering Systems at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he has been a faculty member since 1973. At MIT, he headed the Department of Physics and the Bates Linear Accelerator Center. Most recently, Dr. Moniz served as the founding director of MIT Energy Initiative and of the MIT Laboratory for Energy and the Environment and the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future. A member of the Council of Foreign Relations, Dr. Moniz is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Humboldt Foundation, and the American Physical Society. Dr. Moniz received a Bachelor of Science degree summa cum laude in physics from Boston College, a doctorate in theoretical physics from Stanford University, and honorary degrees from the University of Athens, University of Erlangen-Nuremberg, and Michigan State University. So um, I'm, I'm going to come back to that, some of what we are doing there, but my message is that uh, while the uh, theory of government uh, may lead one to say that the emphasis uh, should be on the early part of the innovation chain research, and that certainly is very, very important. 
I believe because of the acceleration requirements that we need to in fact have a government role further down that innovation chain. As I say, I'll comment a little bit on, on some of that. So that takes us to the question about what, what are we doing about it? And, uh, uh, in, and I'll be talking about the United States uh, principally. Uh, the, uh, in June, the, the President Obama uh, put forward uh, what we believe is a very strong climate action plan. Uh, so really, really commit uh, to, uh, to focusing on uh, addre addressing climate. So thank you very much uh, for that uh, very nice discussion. We are now open for questions. Any questions? Please uh, get up and say what, uh, who you are. Can you hold the microphone closer, yes, maybe? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> there is a growing interest on solar fields worldwide, which are fuels like hydrogen that can be obtained by photocatalytic water separating. And the research uh, initiatives on this area accelerated when the uh, Department of Energy Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis was established in 2010, with funds totaling $122 million for a five year period. What are your thoughts on the future of solar fuels, and do you believe that they can be a viable alternative energy source one day? Well, thank you. Uh, well, first, first of all, let me comment on hydrogen, and then I'll go specifically to solar fuels. Uh, uh, on, on hydrogen, uh, first of all, some of the auto companies um, are, uh, remain committed to going to fuel cell uh, vehicles as uh, future electrical uh, uh, electrical drive uh, vehicles uh, because the there some of them are feel feel that the battery driven pure electric vehicles will suffer from range so called range anxiety can I drive far enough uh, whereas uh, and fuel cells uh, will have the advantages of the efficient electric drivetrain while not having the range anxiety. It does pose other problems about the fueling infrastructure uh, for hydrogen uh, there, but that's, that's certainly one area. Now, on the solar to fuels, uh, this is clearly uh, kind of a holy grail. Uh, obviously, if one can use water, carbon dioxide, and, and sunlight uh, to make fuels, especially more complex hydrocarbon fuels uh, that do not have uh, major infrastructure challenges, well, and, and do them at, at a good cost, uh, obviously, that would solve just about every problem uh, we, we, uh, we can think of. It's clearly uh, a, a, cha a very challenging uh, science and engineering problem, but we believe that in, a, in the portfolio of what we're doing, some of our work, you know, is pretty clearly going to succeed and incrementally reduce costs, and some of the work like solar the fuels, we just have to invest in because it, it, you know it's a, it's a very high risk and very high reward uh, direction. And so I certainly applaud this uh, center here uh, having having a focus on uh, solar uh, solar the fuels. Okay, other questions? Good morning. Thank you for your speech. It's a great pleasure for us that you are here. Good morning. The use of biofuels have been increasing in the world with the primary aim of slowing down the global warming. However, there are also some scientific research that show that biofuels are not as environmentally friendly as they are perceived. The production leads to uh, deforestation and also increasing the food prices. My question is, what are your thoughts on the potential of biofuels obtained from unconventional biosources, such as algae, or as you mentioned, new generation biofuels? Thank you. Right. Uh, Certainly, uh, the environmental impacts of uh, biofuels uh, production uh, are very, very location-specific, uh, uh, no question about it. Uh, in Brazil, for example, uh, with 
very, very optimal conditions in their case for, for sugarcane. Uh, they, have, uh, they have made a pretty large uh, ethanol production, uh, uh, I think, you know, pretty, pretty responsibly. But as a rule, we clearly want to move beyond burning food. Um, so uh, we really want to get biofuels that, have, that, that come from uh, cellulosic feedstock, for example, potentially algae. The, uh, I would say in terms of uh, cellulosic biofuels, enzyme development, et cetera, uh, the progress, as we all know, has been a little bit slower than was uh, hoped for uh, 10 years ago, but, but the progress is real. Uh, we expect in the United States next year the first two commercial cellulosic biorefineries to, uh, to come into uh, uh, operation. Uh, we did give some assistance uh, 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 to those projects, but they're coming there. Today, and let me be clear, uh, today in the programs that our department is sponsoring, still only at pilot scale in terms of cellulosic uh, work, if one does the kind of the engineering modeling in terms of where where that cost trajectory appears to be heading without any new scientific breakthrough, just kind of you know, now it's the engineering of it. Uh, it looks like about uh, $2 and a quarter uh, per gallon of, of ethanol. Now you have to remember, of course, that gallon of eth ethanol does not have the same energy as a gallon of gasoline. And if you, and if you uh, scale it by the by the energy uh, content, then that two dollars and a quarter or two dollars and fifteen cents becomes three dollars and fifty cents or three dollars and seventy-five cents, compared to the wholesale price of gasoline today of about two sixty. So it's about a dollar off, but a dollar, you know. So we have to keep working at it. Uh, it's 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 not it's not now in a different ballpark. You know, it's 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 getting there. Um, uh, and hopefully, in, hopefully by the end of this decade, we'll be in a situation where that's quite, uh, quite, quite competitive with multiple feedstocks, uh, which could serve very, very different uh, places. Uh, the, with regard to algae, clearly that's always, again, been another, another kind of a holy grail um, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, the, uh, one does not need high quality water, uh, typically, so that's a major, major benefit. And um, uh, and also, you know, well, CO2 and kind of a cycle, the CO2 cycle. Uh, there, the challenge has been, and, and again, the research goes on, including here. Uh, the challenge is is scaling. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of algae processes uh, have been good in the test tube, uh, and then uh, the scaling challenge has been very very difficult. So I think it's a combined science engineering uh, challenge. Um, uh, to be honest, I think it's probably maybe a little bit farther than, than away than the cellulosic uh, biofuels, but I'm happy to be surprised. Uh, so, uh, anyway, it's it's an important direction. Okay, a couple of other. Thank you, Dr. Manis. I'm Victoria Joy from Chemical and Biological and Engineering Department. As you know, there is a lot of research going on uh, in many laboratories around the world for developing efficient CO2 capture technologies. So, um, which technologies, uh, in your opinion, are close to implementation on a large scale, and uh, when do you think this will happen? So, I'm sorry, I just made to make sure, did you say for carbon capture? Yes, yeah. for CO2 capture. For CO2 capture, yeah. Um, well, there's two different kinds of uh, solvents, uh, you know, uh, 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 amine solvents or uh, Selexol or these kinds of things. Uh, uh, I think there that we have only begun to uh, search out uh, the space of uh, molecules uh, that can uh, uh, that, that can capture the CO2 effectively and very important release it effectively because in fact for those today one of the problems is the the solvent capture that is used uh, it certainly was not in any way developed for large-scale carbon capture. It's applied in the petrochemical industry. Uh, so, um, so I think there, there's still a, a lot of, a lot of uh, effort to looking at different kinds of solids and, uh, solvents and surfaces uh, for that capture. 
However, there's also a, a fundamentally different set of approaches that I think are, uh, are at earlier stages. Uh, I'll, I'll mention one. Uh, it's a different technology called chemical looping. I don't want to get into too much detail, but uh, fundamentally it's, it's going to two reactors and the oxygen is carried by a metal oxide and, cir and circled around. You can, you can look it up. Uh, but the point is it would produce a pure carbon dioxide stream uh, for, for capture. So I think there are these kinds of technologies as well that are still uh, heading only into an early demonstration phase that could be, big, uh, could be big breakthroughs. They're fundamentally different ways of getting the energy out, out of the coal. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Secretary, thank you for your talk. Uh, this is Rikus Tavar. I've seen Christian. you before. Yeah. Right. <laughs> in political science and international right. relations. My question would be about nuclear energy. Some of the recent studies indicate that the U.S. public opinion is becoming increasingly favorable to the production and usage of nuclear energy. How do you evaluate this trend, especially in comparison with uh, some European countries which have large negative public opinion on nuclear energy, such as Germany? Well, you've sort of answered the question. Um, uh, I mean, in Germany, um, uh, it looks like you know, they, they, they will uh, phase out uh, nuclear power in 2022. Uh, in Japan, of course, because of Fukushima, uh, the plants are shut down and uh, there is uncertainty as to whether and how many uh, nuclear power plants uh, might reopen there. Uh, the, there's a, I would say, pretty obvious, there's a pretty strong public, uh, negative public opinion right now in, in, uh, in Japan. Uh, I'll come to the States, but first I would say, uh, I think the issue there is, uh, well, first of all, as I implied, there will be different low carbon solutions in different places, uh, partly driven by the realities of resource availability, partly driven by public attitudes towards whatever technology, et cetera. And certainly, uh, obviously, if, if, ger if the German public uh, uh, wants to eliminate nuclear power, okay, eliminate nuclear power. But the question to be answered is, what are you going to replace it with? And regrettably, what we are seeing in a number of places, coal, is playing a role uh, in that replacement. And that obviously has not helped carbon emissions. Uh, in fact, in Japan, you may have seen, I mean, the Japanese are understandably in a very difficult position uh, right now uh, with all those nuclear power plants off. Uh, and they have had to revise their, their carbon emissions targets. Uh, yes, please. Well, this would Turkey and the Kurdish regional government in northern Iraq are forging ahead with a series of deals that led the semi-autonomous region to stop giving piping oil to world markets as soon as next year. But the central government in Baghdad uh, remains a major obstacle before that. Uh, what is Washington's evaluation and stance on that issue? Just two points. Uh, first, uh, we are uh, very pleased to see that there's an uh, increased level of dialogue uh, going on uh, between uh, uh, Turkey and Baghdad, uh, Baghdad and Erbil, uh, and, uh, and, and in our view, um, the path forward uh, is up to the parties to decide aligned with the constitutional structures uh, of Iraq. Thank you very much. Let's give another round of applause. Thank you all. Thank you. So what, we, what we have here is that one of the beautiful photographs of American photographer Josephine Paul, oh, wow. who spent uh, 40 years of her life Let's go this way. They want to come in Anatolia, taking pictures of Anatolia that probably doesn't exist now. So. We also have a book and exhibition.